Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to This Week in DEI, where we have Harley DeRoche, also known as Baroness Serafina Sinclair, Laurel and Pelican. She will be reading for us her article, We Were There. Um, and this is a piece uh, that speaks to her experiences as a Black green actor and her research on the Black presence in Renaissance Europe. So afterwards, uh, she'll be taking questions. I'm not gonna go too much more into it because I want her to have a chance to introduce not only herself, but also kind of uh, the piece and where she got her inspiration for it and everything else. So Harley, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, again, uh, I'm Harley, known in the society as uh, Serafina Sinclair. I started playing in the SCA in 1999, right after I graduated from college, I met um, a person online who showed me some pictures and some of his uh, SCA pictures just happened to be in there. And I was like, what is this stuff? What are you doing? And I think I asked him so many questions that he was like, look, just go to SCA.org. <laughs> so um, I went to SCA.org and looked it up and, and found people uh, locally to start playing with it. And the rest is history, as I say. Um, I got into costuming because I was broke and the costumes that I wanted were heinously expensive. Um, and I was like, well, I know how to sew. Um, and at that point, I'd just been doing stuff from you know uh, the big four um, sewing pattern companies. And um, then I uh, hooked up with my Laurel and the Silver Thimble Guild out of Chicago. And that is how I got started. Um, and the funny thing is I actually um, did Italian first because my uh, Laurel is Italian. Um, but that really wasn't what I was interested in. And um, I wanted to do English clothing. And at that point, I had been um, dissuaded or tried to be, attempted to be dissuaded from doing Elizabethan because I am a large person. And I said, no, I don't accept that. I don't accept that people who are large can't do this type of clothing. And so, you know, the very beginning of my career started with me sort of doing things out of spite, I suppose, uh, or just to proving that they can be done. Um, but one thing that's been constant, you know, uh, with my journey of being a living historian is being told that um, Black people weren't in Europe in uh, the Renaissance times, which we know is, it's just false. It's patently false. It's provable. It's, it's, it's not a doubt. And yet, if you ask the average person, regardless of whatever race they are, because um, I've gotten pushback from Black people as well as white people that said, so they, they have two opinions, either Black people weren't there at all, or if Black people were there, that they were slaves. Um, and um, it, both of those things are false. And so um, just over time, you know, I, I really committed myself to being a Black Elizabethan. And I'm like, I knew that Black people had been there, but, you know, in the uh, olden days of yore, um, you know, the internet was in its infancy in terms of, you know, the uh, amount of information that's available now. Um, so really, it was just, I knew we were there, but I really couldn't prove it. Um, and a very nice thing is that um, lately, at least in the last, at least the last five years, there have been um, uh, multiple books written um, by British scholars, you know, that are specifically looking at, you know, the African experience in um, England, and that's what I, you know, that's what I look at. But, you know, if you, anywhere on the continent, there was a huge, or not a huge, but there was a thriving Black population in the Netherlands, in Italy, in Spain. I'm not sure about France, but probably. Um, Black Africans were not unknown on the continent. In fact, if you look um, in the article, um, there's a map. If you look at uh, Morocco to Spain, it's eight miles. It's a lot closer to go from uh, Morocco to England than it is to go from Poland to England just because of mileage. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm just gonna um, go through the article and um, paraphrase or read just depending on um, uh, what I need to get across. Um, so I'm gonna go through this. And then once I go through the article, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I, was, I don't know if that's enough of an introduction. <laughs> Uh, for you, but uh, I just, I wanted, I'm, I'm just tired of um, um, Black folks being told that we don't belong in a space, that that it's uh, political correctness or 
whatever the case may be when it's just not the truth. So um, originally I was supposed to write uh, or to do a presentation at the um, Jamestown Yorktown Foundation event. They do it every other year. And so I was gonna do a talk on the African presence in uh, Renaissance Europe as a part of a larger conference called Fashion in History. Um, and so that event didn't happen you know, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and then um, Dr. Uh, Justine DeYoung, who is a professor at uh, uh, FIT, uh, is she at the NYC campus? Uh, I'm not sure, I have to look up which campus she's at, but um, she actually runs um, a blog called the Fashion History Timeline. And that's uh, fashionhistory.fitnyc.edu, I believe is how yeah, you can get to it there. Um, and so she approached me to write, um, if I could you know, present uh, a, a blog post for her. And I was like, I had at that point, because I didn't have the deadline of um, working on the talk anymore, I had stopped working on it, but I was like, all right, let's do this. Um, and then I remember immediately being like, oh my gosh, I am not an academic type person at all. I haven't written any um, papers in this point, 20 years. Yeah, I graduated in yeah, 99, it's 21 years. Um, what am I gonna do? But, you know, I have um, uh, Dr. Kaufman's book, um, Black Tutors. Oh, I should have had the books with me, but anyway. So um, Dr. Kaufman's book, uh, Dr. Onyeka's book, um, where he actually, um, I have his thesis and then um, I have a book that he wrote uh, based on the thesis. Um, do, 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 do. Um, so, okay. Um, so originally when I was writing the article, I was just kind of sort of be fact-based like this happened and then this happened and this happened and this happened. But I realized that I really wasn't being true to my own voice and so, um, having a conversation with a friend of mine who's an editor and she said, you need to write it like you're talking to a friend. And after she gave me that advice, I was like, okay, um, I was able to find my voice. And so uh, in the article I write, um, I'm writing this essay to a very specific audience, other black nerds like me who've been told we don't belong. It would be great if other people reading learned a thing or two and check their assumptions out the door. Um, and I was reminded of a conversation that I had with a young lady who um, recently um, found the SCA and she had been discouraged and some other groups that she was trying to participate in, they just flat out told her, well, you know, it really wouldn't be accurate because black people weren't in Europe during the time period covered by the SCA. And it just broke my heart because, you know, she had given up and, uh, or almost given up, but you know, she got introduced to me and I introduced her to you. I don't know if you remember this, you know, conversation that we were having, you being um, Jess, but, you know, just explaining to her that not only were we there, but there are also people, you know, people of color who do this modernly and that, you know, um, yes, it's a very small percentage, but that if she wanted to pursue it, that, you know, there would be other people that looked like her that were there. And the words that she said to me were, um, the main reason why I didn't look into history stuff or join any groups is because she encountered a few people that said it just wouldn't be 100% accurate. And her words were that it was pretty discouraging to be honest. And so, you know, it, it's such a microaggression to be told that you don't belong in a space um, based on just 100% ignorance. Um, and so throughout the article I have, so I, have, I put a picture of myself in there and the garb that I made. Um, I'm actually gonna be um, featured on the cover of uh, the next installment of the Tudor Taylor book called The Typical Tudor. Um, I met the uh, Tudor, Tudor, Taylor, Tudor Taylor team, that's a mouthful, when um, I hosted them uh, twice, uh, once in 2014 and then again in 2016. And I am just jokingly said, oh, you should put me in the next book. And then uh, in September of 2019, um, uh, Jane reached out to me and was like, hey, so you want to be in the book? And I was like, uh, yes, I want to be in the book. And we were going to try to figure out if I could um, be photographed here. Um, but then it was, you know, then they invited me to come to England. And I was like, I will figure out how to pay for it. And I had a fundraiser and uh, put stuff on credit cards and made it um, work. And they actually um, um, 
did sponsor my ear first. So that, that made it um, a lot easier for me to be able to get there. And I went to Europe. Uh, it was the first time I'd been to Europe um, and I was there for 10 days and traveled by myself, which was a thing I hadn't really done to that extent before. So it was just a very um, amazing experience overall. And, um, you know, the Tudor Taylor team has um, championed the cause of, you know, reenactors of color. Um, and it just, it, it just heartens me um, when people uh, who are not people of color are just as committed to getting the truth out as people of color. So um, back to my article, that level of ignorance and discouragement is, is exactly what I'm here to address. 22 years ago, I didn't have a comeback. I knew that black people had been in Britain from the days of Rome, but being able to readily prove it with solid sources is different. And basically, you know, the, the youths don't know how good they got it. Now you can just Google things and um, the information that would make somebody a laurel 20 years ago, you can just pull up on Google and there's just so many sources. So I know that, you know, there's there's a sort of a running complaint about the bar to, of, you know, to mastery getting higher and higher, but it's just, it's, it's a necessary, not necessary, but it's going to happen just because of, you know, access to information and technology and whatnot. So, um, but basically, you know, the premise that there's, like I said, there's two premises that I hear. Either there were no Black people in 16th century England slash Europe, or you'd have just been a slave anyway. Now, in other parts of Europe, um, Africans were enslaved. But what, from what I can tell, it's not necessarily, um, it was specific to the person rather than you are a black person, therefore you are a slave, which is different than how it was in the United States, which, you know, I mean, there were, you know, free people of color um, that in states that did not allow slavery, but for the most part, you know, you could have been kidnapped from where you were taken back to a slaveholding state and, and there would have been no recourse for you. So, um, so I continue to say, how many times have I heard some version of this falsehood? Um, these people usually go on to tell me that the history of black people in England starts with the transatlantic um, trade of enslaved people. You're just trying to be politically correct. Too many white people have no issues telling me that they're tired of real history being tampered with because of modern sensibilities, like I'm the person that's in the wrong. People are uncomfortable with the truth because they believe the whitewashed version that they've been taught in school and consume in popular media. Game of Thrones is something that comes to mind. Game of Thrones is fantasy, right? There are dragons, there is magic. Uh, you know, no one with any amount of common sense would, would say that this is historically accurate. And yet time and time again, things like Game of Thrones or any number of movies where there are literally no people of any color other than white people. Um, and so that's just what's in the, the popular um, uh, frame of mind. Um, you know, so getting back to Game of Thrones, the only black people in that series are enslaved and the men are eunuchs. And, you know, I, I think that was a very purposeful choice by the, the, the author of the book series. I don't have any real kind words to say to him. Um, and like I said, even black people just assume the same thing because, you know, we, for the most part, unless you go looking for the history yourself, it's just not presented in any meaningful way anywhere else. And the irony of it is, aside from the, the practice of, and I believe it's pronounced the lineage, um, V-I-L-L-E-I-N-A-G-E, -E, um, which is a very specific um, type of slavery, and it would not have applied to Africans anyway. Slavery was not legal in England in the 16th century. Any African, even if enslaved somewhere else, as soon as they set foot on English soil, they would have been free. So, you know, it's not to say that being an African living in England was easy, but, you know, just the assertion that I would have been enslaved is just wrong because it was not legal. Um, then I, <laughs> I have a funny, not so funny story. So um, I was on cast at the Bristol Renaissance Fair uh, for four years. So let's see, my son was born in 2010. So it was 2006 to 2010, because he was a baby my last summer that I worked there. And um, so I lived about half an hour away from site. So I wasn't going to go through the whole rigmarole of changing my clothes, 
there. I'm like in half an hour, I'll be home. I'll just drive out from, excuse me, um, you know, wearing what I'm wearing all day. And people at the truck stop, it's by the rent fair. So they're used to seeing people in garb. It's not a big deal. So I remember I went in and there were, I think three or four truckers. I believe all of them were black and they kind of gave me funny looks. I'm like, okay, it happens. I went to the bathroom, came out of the bathroom and they kind of, you know, they got my attention and they were like, are you okay? And I'm like, uh, yeah, why wouldn't I be okay? And they were like, well, you know, and I'm like, uh, no, I, I, I don't know what you're referring to. And basically they looked at the way I was dressed, decided that I was dressed like a slave. And then they were like, well, we just wanted to make sure, you know, we weren't gonna have to mount a rescue. And I'm like, okay, I'm, that is, I'm good. I appreciate your concern. I was, I was just so, I was offended on a couple of levels. One, um, if people are enslaving people, they don't really let them go into truck stops un, uh, you know, unguarded. That's not really a thing that happens. But also, you know, the, the nerd part of me was like, um, these clothes are from the 1500s, not the 1800s. Like, but you know, to the general public, you know, once you put an apron and a cap on, you know, it's all the same thing. It's all kind of old timey. Uh, but it just, you know, and the, the more I thought about it and the more I thought about it, the more I thought about it, it just frustrated me that, you know, when you, when, when we talk about Black people in history, it's just, it's always slave. It's always filtered through the lens of slavery. And that, that, that is the only option that people um, see for us. And it's just incredibly frustrating. Um, so, you know, why bother, right? Um, it matters to me that Black people understand that we were there, even if white people don't. It matters to me that a Black person can hold their own in a conversation with ignorant people and spit facts back at them. You know, it matters to me because these assertions and viewpoints are based on a racist, whitewashed Hollywood version of Europe as this white utopia that was ruined by Africans and people of color. But really, the truth of the matter is, yes, we were there. We've been here all along. Um, then that my article has more um, images in it of various and sundry people. Um, unfortunately, there's only one um, um, image of an African during that time that is verifiable, and that's of John Blank, and I'll talk about him later. There's a, um, there's a portrait of the coronation of uh, Henry VIII, I think. Henry VII? Henry VIII. Um, but otherwise, all the other depictions um, are from other countries, but there are plenty of um, um, Italian and German and Spanish um, depictions of clearly, you know, African uh, people. You know, uh, Cosmo de' Medici is, um, it's said that his mother um, was African. And when you look at um, paintings of him, he looks like he could be a light-skinned Black person, but, you know, I'm not sure if they've been able to verify that or not, but, you know, there are other um, Black people or, or worlds in Europe that are um, thought to be Black as well. Charlotte of Mecklenburg? Um, I, I'd have to look it up because she's after time period, so I don't, um, I don't know a lot about her, but um, Queen Charlotte is another one in England. Um, so where does this persistent belief of an all-white Tudor England, which, you know, is roughly 1485 to 1603 stem from? It's bad history, it's bad anthropology, popular media. Um, when the BBC posted a cartoon short of Roman England on YouTube, one of the high-ranking soldiers was depicted as a black man. White people on the internet lost their minds. The amount of hate that's generated by that choice shows just how much racism permeates our collective discourse. My least favorite part of this dialogue was a tw Twitter battle between, there's a mathematician, ma mathematician Nassim Taleb, who was um, fanning the flames of bigotry and ignorance to line his pockets. He wrote a book and so he was trying to sell his book. So he got into a Twitter battle with um, renowned classicist Mary Beard, who's also a professor 
of classics at Cambridge University. So, um, and then uh, in the article, there are um, some images, but the one that, um, that I put in here says, you know, thank God the BBC is portraying Roman Britain as ethnically diverse. I mean, who cares about historical accuracy, right? Again, it's not in dispute that, uh, you know, people from all over the world were part of um, the Roman Empire. Like, it, it's not like the historians and, and anthropologists are saying this, but yet the knowledge of our existence on an academic level has just not permeated to, through the rest of, you know, um, our collective, the collective um, mindset. Um, let me just um, skip here. But the, the part that that is most frustrating is that when a white actor is playing a historical character, none of this ever comes up. So for comparison, um, Brad Pitt played um, Achilles, who's a Greek demigod in the film Troy. So without trying to get into whether or not Greeks are black or white or whatever, because I, I don't have the academic uh, <laughs> understanding of, you know, where in, in terms of racial divide Greeks would fall. But for the most part, most people consider Greeks to be white, right? So you have a Brad Pitt, who is not Greek at all. He's Scottish, Irish, English. I looked it up so I could be, you know, accurate. He's a person not of Greek descent, pay, playing a person, a mythical person, but still of Greek dis descent, and no one cares. But yet, um, when, um, again, the BBC had a Black actor playing Achilles, again, the same sort of hate and everything was um, lob you know, lobbed at them by people online. <coughs> Excuse me. Many white people complain about the revisionist liberal blackwashing of history anytime we assert the truth about the contributions of black people throughout history. The reality is that the racist whitewashing of history has actually been par, par for the course. And then um, I give an example about um, 19th century um, United States. So it's estimated that black men accounted for about 25% of cowboys working in the United States in the 19th century. And yet until very recently, there have not been many depictions of black cowboys uh, in Hollywood. Hollywood's most famous cowboy, the Long Ranger, is speculated to have been based on black cowboy Bass Reeves, but where is his movie, right? Um, I had never even heard of him until I went looking, you know, for, um, re you know, doing research for this article. Um, the average U.S. resident might scoff at the, the idea that black people even know how to ride horses, let alone that they would be cowboys. Um, during a recent protest against police brutality here in Chicago, a black horseman rode through the streets of downtown and was accused of stealing a police horse. The concept that a black man owned a horse and rode well was something that had to be explained away. The vitriol that was lobbed at the horseman rose through the threats of violence and his car was eventually vandalized. His house was vandalized. Black people are pigeonholed and then denigrated. It's just beyond exhausting. Um, you know, and it, it's, again, it's just um, cowboy is a job. Like, you know, now it's just because, I mean, it's still a job that people have, but, you know, it, it's like a, it's like leprechaun or, you know, genie or something. People, I think they just, they don't think of it as a job, like, you know, like a, a police officer or, you know, a doctor or a teacher or something like that. It's, it's a job. It's not John Wayne with his, you know, six shooters, you know, uh, keeping the peace uh, in the Old West. Um, so if you just think about all of the popular movies, TV shows, and books that are set in, you know, Renaissance England or really anywhere in Europe, uh, and you think about how how often are Black people even depicted, let alone giving, given speaking lines or a major role, um, you know, something that's happened since I wrote the article is there is a new movie coming out and Anne Boleyn is being portrayed by a Black woman, and she's a very dark-skinned Black woman. And again, people are just losing their minds. And I'm like, so you don't have any issues with, you know, if there's a, a, a character of color, you know, and then a movie gets made, and then um, it's a white person that gets made in that, because, you know, we expect that white people are heroes, and that white people are, you know, scientists and all that kind of stuff. But anytime there's any sort of 
situation where we're, you know, a person of color gets cast into a role that maybe isn't 100% authentic. There's all these questions that come up and I'm like, so let's not pretend like it's about um, accuracy. It's just about what people are willing, you know, the kind of roles that they are willing to see black people, um, black people play. So then um, I talk about my own story here. Um, so, you know, and I started participating in living history events about 22 years ago. Um, my then partner, um, who's white, um, he just assumed that I would adopt an African persona. And he was very excited about this, um, but I just, I was not interested in doing an African impression. And I, obviously I don't have anything against um, you know, the continent of Africa, it's a, but it's, you know, it's a very large place. And at that point, it's just, I wanted to wear English clothing and that's what I was interested in. Um, I actually picked Scotland because his persona was Scottish. So it was a, I guess, you know, tribute or homage, whatever to him. Um, but the nice thing was, is I could be a Scot living in England, which is, you know, happened all the time. Um, but, you know, it was real, it, it turned into a real bone of contention between us because I'm like, look, yes, I am a black person. I am also English, or not me, but you know, Serafina. Serafina, Serafina, or Scottish actually. Serafina is a Scot living in England, and and I sh and and I don't have to have some kind of convoluted backstory because you know, in the SCA, people have these really bizarre stories about you know, my mother was captured by pirates. Like, let's be real. If your mother were captured by pirates she probably unfortunately would have been sexually assaulted and then murdered. She would not have been, you know, this romance where she's, you know, kept on the ship and then they sail off into the sunset. That just is not a thing that would <laughs> happen. So, um, you know, and, you know, and there, there are, you know, Black people were in Scotland as well. There's actually a book I haven't gotten it yet, but um, about, um, again, um, um, courtiers, 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 I always say that word wrong, I think it's courtiers, um, black courtiers that went, that, um, you know, traveled to um, the various courts of uh, Europe with whatever sovereign that they were uh, in service to. So, you know, the question is, you know, why is there such resistance to acknowledging our existence? I mean, that's a question, you know, that could probably take a lifetime to answer, but you know, frankly, it just boils down to racism. Um, to acknowledge our existence and contributions is to question white people's sense of self and achievement. Black people in the United States and in uh, the United Kingdom and other places have had our culture taken away from us and replaced with the mythos of the inferior enslaved person. So when I, as a you know, show up at a living history event, not as a slave or a servant, but as someone wearing markers of rank in nice clothing it's much easier to dismiss me as a product of political correctness rather than to acknowledge that I'm um, recreating a person who might have actually existed. So, you know, the big question always is, well, how do we know that there were black people in Tudor and, and Jacobian England? I'm like, well, the same way that we know that there were any people in those times and places, historians, anthropologists, you know, archeologists. Um, the lives of average people are generally not recorded for posterity because they just aren't all that interesting. Um, however, there are so many church records and contemporary references to Africans in England and the rest of Europe, but I specifically study England, that our existence during that time cannot be denied. Yes, we were there. It's quite simple. Um, so um, something that seems to have happened um, over and over again is that um, Africans intermarry, uh, yeah, Africans intermarry with white English. And so there are um, white people in England today that do not know that they are descendant um, from Africans because, you know, by the time, you know, like my child's father is white and he's pretty fair skinned. If he has a child with a white person, you know, genetics being what it is, that child would probably not look like they have any, you know, um, uh, African genes in them at all. I mean, you know, things get expressed in various and sundry ways, and especially 400 years later, if if you you have one African, um, you know, foreparent, and then all the rest of those successive generations are white, it's just not going to be. There's not going to be any physical, you know, resemblance um, left. Um, however. Um, 
whether or not Africans were a part of English society in the 16th century, is, it's not a matter of speculation or debate. We aren't begging to be included so that we feel better about ourselves. We're demanding that our presence and our contributions be acknowledged. Um, and then, you know, in the article, I have more um, depictions, uh, you know, from Flemish paintings, from uh, German paintings. Um, there's Italian, um, what are these called? Um, what do you call the little cameos? I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> Some Italian cameos, and it's you know it's clear. I mean, they are clearly African. Um, so, and then um, I um, finished the article by just um, highlighting some of the folks. Let me see: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, in um, Dr. Kaufman's book, she talks about ten people. Um, I just listed seven here. Um, but the, like I said, the cool thing is that there are, uh, it's mostly parish records where you can see that people uh, were baptized, which was honestly the most important thing to the English because they had a very strong distrust of the Spanish for you know obvious reasons, being a political. And so a Spaniard would be much more circums circumspect, is that the right word? Circumspect than um, an African, especially an African person that had gone out of their way to become baptized, to take an English name, you know, and then, like I said, people intermarried. So I'm just going to go through these folks real quick here. So I've got um, John Blink, the trumpeter, and that's the image that we have. So um, the title of the piece is um, Black Trumpeter at Henry VIII's Tournament, um, done in 1511. So there's um, there's three dudes on horseback um, wearing livery. Um, and then on his head is some, it kind of looks like it might be a turban, it's just some, some sort of wrap. The other two um, trumpeters just have their hair like, you know, flowing locks and then he's clearly wearing some sort of hat. Um, so he was a trumpeter in the court of Henry VII. Um, it's uh, possible that he came with Catherine of Aragon about 1501 when she left Spain to marry Arthur who was actually, um, she was married to Arthur, that was um, uh, Henry's older brother, but he passed away. And he was paid. Um, he was paid uh, eight, now it says eight D, I don't know, I don't know what the, um, I don't know what the dollar amount, I don't know, or not dollar, the monetary unit is, but it's, he was paid eight, whatever these units, um, a day. Um, and then he actually petitioned uh, Henry the Eighth. Um, and he got a hundred percent raise. So his salary went from eight D a day to 16 D a day, which is I mean, not nothing for you to be able to negotiate yourself a raise. And then he even got a wedding present from Henry the eighth in 1512. So the fact that, you know, he was paid means he was not, you know, enslaved. And also he got a present, you know, he was important enough that Henry the eighth, you know, um, honored his wedding. So that was pretty cool. Um, and, you know, but like I said earlier, unfortunately, this is the only known drawing of an African person during um, um, the 16th century. So the fact that there's not a whole lot of depictions of Black people probably, I'm sure, contributes to the fact that we weren't there. <coughs> Excuse me. The next person is Jacques Francis, who was a salvage diver. diver. And so um, he was actually a part of the um, dive team to bring up some of the guns from the Mary Rose that so, uh, sunk in 1546. And so not only was he on the, the dive team, he actually was the head of the dive team. Uh, and then because of the reputation that they had um, developed from doing this first job, they got um, asked to do another job. So he worked for an Italian, um, Peter Corsi. So, it's not known whether or not he was paid by Corsi or if he was um, enslaved by Corsi. It's kind of sort of unclear. However, um, uh, his uh, employer, I'll just say that, his employer was accused of theft and Francis actually was called into court to provide testimony. And so he was the first person of African descent on record to be deposed in an English court. And the way that English law was written is enslaved people could not provide evidence in court. So the fact that his testimony was entered into the court speaks a lot to the fact that he was not enslaved because it just was, it would not have been legal for him to um, give testimony. 
Um, the next person is Mary Phyllis. I think it's how you pronounce it, F-I-L-L-I-S. Um, she was originally from Morocco. Um, she came um, with her father, uh, Phyllis of, of Morisco, was in Morocco, um, as a small child. She was about six in 1583. Um, she was a seamstress who worked for um, Millicent Porter. Um, and then um, after Porter died in 1599, there's not any more evidence of you know, what happened to her, but she was baptized on June 3rd, 1597, which is why we know um, who she was. And then one of my favorites um, is a dude named Reasonable Black Man. So, you know, when <laughs> you know, when you're, you know, picking a name, right, you might as well pick one that's gonna, it's gonna, you know, like, you know, Madonna, Cher. So he actually was a silk weaver. And so he lived in Southward uh, during the last uh, quarter of the 16th century, roughly 1579 to 1592. Um, Dr. Kaufman thinks that he came to London um, through the Netherlands, like I said, which had a, um, a sizable African population, wherein, and I think the population of the Netherlands and African was Africans marrying other Africans so that, you know, you, you then had um, Black people who were born there of two Black parents. Um, so, you know, different than what was happening uh, in England. And so the Netherlands actually had um, a, a good um, uh, or a thriving um, textile industry because, you know, like, you know, much like now, you know, Black people did get pigeonholed into very specific um, occupations and um, textiles was one of those occupations. So he was actually able to, um, you know, make a, make a name for himself. Um, and then he did have at least uh, three children, two of whom uh, died in London in the plague of 1592. Um, the next person I want to talk about is um, a person who I've actually um, have considered doing my own impression of her, um, Catalina of Almondsbury, um, independent single woman, right? So I'm like, you know, so again, you know, I said, you know, I'm tempted to, to quote the Destiny's Child song here, but I'll spare, <laughs> spare you talking about, you know, independent women. But pretty simply, you know, she lived life on her own terms. She was unmarried. And she was not, you know, she was not enslaved, which is a huge thing, you know, to be at that time period to be an unmarried woman who was making your own money, you know, that, you know, until, you know, what people don't understand is like until the 1980s in these United States, oh, it was very hard for a woman to get a credit card in her own name, to get a bank account in her own name, you know, last century. And then this woman was, you know, living on her own terms, you know, in the 16th century, which is huge. Um, she owned a cow and she made money by selling milk and butter to her neighbors. Um, and they even have an inventory of everything um, that she owned, which probably happened uh, when she died around 1625. Um, then we have Diego, the circumnavigator. Um, Diego became a crew member aboard Francis Drake's ship in Panama in 1572. He was able to broker a partnership between Drake's crew and the Cimarrons, uh, and the Cimarrons are African settlers who had formerly been Spanish captives, but they uh, were living free in Panama, um, and they seized over 150,000 pesos of Spanish silver and gold. Uh, Diego went with uh, Drake back to Plymouth and then set sail in 1577 on the Golden Hind to go around the world. He actually um, died in the Ma Maluku, I'm not exactly sure if that's the correct pronunciation, M-A-L-U-K-U, -U. I'm not sure which syllable, it's either Maluku or Maluku Islands. Um, they were then known as the Spice Islands, but I like to use the um, original names, not the um, colonial names. Um, and, you know, the Spice Islands were named that because of nutmeg, mace, uh, and clove, which is part of pumpkin spice. Um, which is really silly, but I used to be like, I used to totally hate on um, pumpkin spice. And then when I started getting into uh, Elizabethan cooking, I'm like, oh, I'm just being ignorant because pumpkin spice is delightful. Um, so, and I actually make, uh, on a completely unrelated note, I make pun uh, pumpkin spice uh, pancakes and my family loves them. So, um, you know, people, you know, it's just, there's so many just misconceptions about 
you know, the time periods that we study in general, you know, everybody wore brown. Okay. Uh, no, not true. I mean, we, I mean, we have portraiture of, of people not wearing brown, but that everybody wore brown and everything was boiled to death and, every, and there was no flavor. And I'm like, if anything, people don't use flavor now, but they, you know, they certainly, I mean, there were so many spices that had just become available in anyway. So that's a whole nother subject. And then um, the last person that I talked about was Anne Cobby. Um, she was known as the Tawny Moor with soft skin. So uh, she was a sex worker who worked in 1620s in the St. Clement Danes Parish. And she actually um, commanded a high price because of her looks. So, you know, again, when it comes to cultural exchange, sex is one of the first bound boundaries that is typically crossed. <laughs> Very specifically, you know, you know, white women or white men and women of color. I mean, obviously it goes, you know, the other way as well, but you know, you go to a place and the men are going to find the women. That's just sort of how it goes. And the reason why we know her name is because um, the people who own the brothel where she uh, worked were brought into court. And so she was one of the people, um, again, who I believe had to give testimony. So originally when I was writing this, I, you know, didn't want to include her because she was a sex worker, but I, I'm like, you know, there's nothing wrong with sex work. And I, I don't want to um, diminish that because again, you know, um, 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 prostitution was not illegal. And, you know, she actually made a very good living because of her looks and because she was, you know, unusual, she wasn't, you know, white, um, you know, and again, people want to, you know, you know, fetish, you know, fetish, fetish, I can't say the word, fetish, fet, <laughs> fetishization, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, that word of, of specifically of women of color and of black women, especially, you know, we are, are, are depicted as being, you know, sex hungry and voracious and, and, you know, uh, acrobatic lovers and all this other stuff. So, um, you know, but, you know, when you're trying to stand out from the crowd, you know, and you, you do what you got to do in order to, um, to get paid. So those are just seven other people. There's, there was, there were other people, you know, listed in the, the book as well. So, um, I highly recommend that folks, um, uh, check those books out. So, um, like I said earlier, depictions of Africans in Tudor England are virtually non-existent other than the one that we know about. Um, however, we have a wealth of images of Africans in other parts of Europe. It's important for these images to be seen uh, because there can be no doubt compared to written descriptions because, you know, depending on, on you know, like color names, for example, the words that we use for colors are not the words that they use for colors. So when, when you're just going off of a written description, um, it, you know, unless it specifically says this person was African, um, you know, it can be, you know, argued away. However, when you're looking at um, depictions, looking at drawings, you're looking at these images, and then, and then when you put that together with the written account, then there can be, um, there can be no doubt. So, um, you know, the, the conclusion of my article here is, I'll just read it. Uh, over the years, I've come to the conclusion that many white people think that I'm cosplaying a white person and that offends them to the core. They think that it's not fair that I get to be a black person in a white space, while if they put on the clothes associated with my history, i.e. African, and paint their faces, they get called out for blackface and a cultural appropriation. The joy that fills my soul when I can point to stories of actual black people living in England as full-fledged members of Tudor society and not as slaves or servants could fuel the earth for millennia. I just, it just makes me <laughs> super excited. Um, like I said, most people that I talk to assume that Africans in, in, in 16th century England and the rest of Europe were discriminated against like black people are today in many parts of Europe and certainly the United States. Uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's Othello is one example um, given a, as evidence of such. However, you know, scandal sells and, you know, yes, Shakespeare is, is, is hailed as the foremost playwright and, and he studied and all this other stuff. But you got to remember back in the day, he's basically like Quentin Tarantino. You know, he's just, he's a, he's a guy that's writing popular um, plays and, you know, whatever it's going to take to, to sell it to the masses, you know, is, is what, you know, melodrama, it sells. Um, 
But, you know, Africans, you know, there's, like I said, there's many examples of Africans being a part of their local parishes and enjoying full membership in the community. Um, you know, like I said, their acceptance of the local faith went a long way to helping them fit in, adopting English names, and like I said, intermarrying. So there's there's plenty of examples of, It's it seems like it's more, well, when I was looking at it, there tended to be more white, English men who had children with Black African women, but it certainly went the other way as well as, like I said, where you had Black African men who had children with white English women. It just um, just depends on how people um, uh, ended up coming to um, England. So the end of my article is Black excellence is not new. Yes, we were there. And then my tagline is die mad about it. So <laughs> anybody that knows me knows that that is something um, that I say all the time. But I'm just, I, I will, you know, will never not be passionate about the truth of um, our contributions and just the fact that we were there, that we were not slaves, that we were members of the society like everyone else. And the fact that this still is a myth that persists to this day means that there's way more, you know, education that needs to be done about this, even amongst people in a society that are supposedly dedicated to history. So there, that is my, uh, that's my presentation in a nutshell. Um, and then let me just go ahead and close this. I didn't know if there were any questions that had come across that um, folks had, and I'm happy to answer those. I love this article. So I really enjoyed kind of the the director's cut commentary of hearing you go through it and talk about your process. Um, we have a couple of messages with questions. So I'll go through. Um, one is very broad and very general. Uh, can you tell us about when and how you got into the SCA? Yes. So um, like I said, so I was in college. <laughs> So if you, uh, you, you weren't, I don't even know, were you born yet? Yeah, I'm just trying to think, you're barely, I'm trying to remember, I never remember how old you are, I'm sorry. I'm not an infant. No, I know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being that guy, I apologize. No, um, so, uh, but MIRC was a, um, I don't even know what you would call it, like a chat program. Um, and so I had met um, this dude on there and then um, this is when everybody had personal web pages. So this was before MySpace and before Facebook and everything. Like, you know, people would, I like dogs and, you know, whatever. So he had his web page and um, he had pictures of you know, just random stuff. And then some of the pictures were of SCA fighting. And I was like, whoa, what is that? That's crazy. Like, you look like you're getting, you know, you're, I think I literally said to him, you look like you're getting ready to be hit by a battering ram. I'm like, what is this? I got to know what this, this stuff is. I, I've always just been fascinated with um, um, specifically England and, um, you know, the pretty dresses and all that kind of stuff. And once I found out that there was a group of people that does this, I'm like, oh, great. Um, and then um, I started with, um, like I said, the, what was that? The first thing I ever went to was in February of 99. My mom actually drove me to um, an ANS night at um, Jim and Elaine's house. Oh, maybe it was Amber. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Rock Heldon, folks. So Rock Heldon is one of the um, cantons of the Barony of Ayrton, but, but this is pre-baronial time, so it was the Shire. But they had a, an arts and sciences night at their house and I didn't really know the suburbs that well, so. And I didn't want to go by myself. So my mom <laughs> drove with me <laughs> and we went off into the night and, you know, to meet these strange weirdos who, you know, are into this history stuff. And then I was hooked. So I um, found out there's many different, you know, because Chicago um, at that point had six groups. And so I went to everybody that had a thing I would go to, to you know, to, just to see what group I liked playing with. And I ended up... Um, playing with the um, Shire of Grey Gargoyles, which is now also a canton of um, the Barony as well. Um, and then just, you know, I fell in with the Silver Thimble Guild. So I kind of got thrown into the deep end in terms of working on sewing projects for royalty from like almost day one. 
Um, so, you know, just, you know, through, through interacting um, with that group of folks, just got to, you know, meet people and kind of, um, I know a lot of people have this sort of peer fear thing that they go through where, you know, you just come in and you're like, oh my gosh, who are all these important people? But, um, you know, when you've cooked bacon for the king and, you know, and, and done a fitting on the queen and seen her in her underwear, you know, it's like, they just like, oh, these are just regular people that happen to be, you know, important in our game, but they're still just people. And so, um, and then just, you know, from knowing them and becoming um, a retainer, that was another way that I got to um, meet crowns. And I literally would just walk up to people like, hi, I'm Serafina and I want to help. And they're like, all right. Um, so I ended up working, I'm just trying to think, probably at least four or five um, reigns, not quite in a row, but uh, in, in a short, short succession. And then um, I became a Laurel in 2007. I was elevated by, um, oh Lord Jesus, Palomar and Aislinn, sorry. Um, and then I became a Pelican in 2011 was elevated by um, uh, Runa and Ike Brander. I was gonna say that I was like, there's two Runas, I gotta make sure I keep it all straight in my head. So, um, and then I've been given a variety of uh, other awards as well. Um, so hopefully that that answers the question. So um, just a, a chance encounter on the internet is how I ended up in the SCA. That's the short version of it. <laughs> um, so, You've been doing research into this for a while. What is the most surprising thing you found in your research? Hmm. Um, something that I haven't really delved into quite yet, but um, when I um, discovered that um, the, our assumptions about the racism that 16th century Africans would have experienced is just wrong. So, you know, it, I mean, there were not that many Black people in London. However, everyone in London probably at some point would have encountered a Black person or more to like, to the point where it been like, yes, it is unusual, but it is not outside of the experience of the average Londoner to have interacted with a black person. And so, um, oh, cause I was trying to, I was trying to see if I could find any kind of numbers and, you know, the black population, depending on when, you know, it was in the hundreds of people. And so, but you got to think about, you know, the population of London at that time wasn't any more than about 20 or 25,000. So if you've got like 400 out of 20,000, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's not nothing, you know? So I was just, I was heartened by just how many Africans were there. And then to see how fully integrated into society that Africans were is again, just, you know, my assumptions was, okay, well, it was like how it is here and how, you know, a black person, I, I'm, a, I'm a black person who lives in an area where there's not a whole lot of black people. And so, you know, having to deal with that um, and just what I encounter, you know, well, not now, because we don't, no one goes outside, but just <laughs> what I encounter was probably, I mean, maybe not, it was just different because, you know, here I'm living with a legacy of being descended from people who were enslaved in this country and, and the racism involved in that. And Black Africans then were not living that experience. I mean, yes, they were exotic. They were other. Um, and certainly there was racism where people were, you know, well, we are better than you. But it was, it was more so, it was, it was, they also thought they were better than the French. You know what I mean? It's, it's the fact that they were Black was not the reason to put them down. It was just that they were other, that they, um, because, you know, the English, you know, like everybody else thought that they were, you know, the creme de la creme, the most evolved, the most this and that. And so when you um, uh, meet people who like smiling, like, like, if you like, even if you think now, like the, the, if you look at portrayals of um, pickaninnies and minstrels and all that kind of stuff, it's this 
carefree, jolly, jovial late person. And so you had that kind of stereotype where um, because Africans made a joyful noise, made were, were demonstrative, you know, um, laughing, um, um, that that was seen as a reason to look down on them. And eventually it's like, okay, well, these Africans have these traits and we see these traits are bad, eventually over time becomes, well, if you are a black person, you are bad, but it didn't start off that way. And so um, that's really the next um, journey of my um, research is to, to uncover what was the black experience and, and, and how would we have um, been received. And just again, to dispel those myths that, oh, that we would have been automatically seen as less than, but it really like the English didn't, didn't trust the Spanish because you had the, you had the split with, you know, the Catholics and the Protestants. So anybody who was Catholic was going to be suspect. I mean, hell in England, uh, it was only in the last, what, 20 something years, maybe I don't even know that, that a Catholic could even ascend to the throne in England. Like that's how deep that Protestant Catholic thing went that only just now in our lifetime did they change the law i mean it was it was codified in law that a catholic could not sit the throne of england despite the fact that i mean england is not at war with spain as far as i know so <laughs> um i mean just like the fact that they just changed it so that um what's the what's the word um for the first son oh, i can't think of that word um inheritance no like there, there, there's a specific word for like the first son gets all the everything and then because that's like that's why you have like a lot of second sons of nobility became you know um priests I'm a uh yes 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 <laughs> Prim yeah i was like because at first i was like I was like, primogeniture, is that the same as primanocta, primanocta, but that's something different. Yeah, primogeniture. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, wait, those are two different things. So primogeniture that's is- That's too zesty for this. I, hey, 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 I'm sorry. But yeah, primogeniture is the oldest son gets all the everything, unless, you know, the will is, you know, so, and it just so happens that um, uh, Will and Kate's first child is a boy. So it is, it, you know, unless something happens, he will be king after William, but- um, you know, just the, the Britain just they don't change things very quickly. Like, you know, they're just it's a very conservative, and when I say conservative, I mean just not changing quickly um society. So um I have a question yes related to US. So do you think that US folks talk about historical black people as being slaves in part because a lot of them, white folks are still trying to come to terms with their own history and slavery? I think more so it's, it's a function of popular media because, um, you know, when you, when you, if there's a movie about black people, it is usually set in slave times, right? So, and so all the, that is all, you know, in this country, the history of black people, you know, obviously there, there were people who were not enslaved in the beginning, but for the most part, the, the history of black people in the United States begins with the, 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 the transatlantic slave trade. So because of that, people just assume because, you know, Americans are very um, arrogant and we think that the world revolves around us. I mean, like many other places, but you know, we very specifically have this, you know, American exceptionalism thing. And so we just assume that whatever we have experienced is what there is. And, um, you know, so we're either, if, if there's a show, a movie with black people, we are either slaves or criminals. I mean, for the vast majority of it, there's, there aren't, you know, there aren't a lot of depictions of black people that aren't, where black people are stars that aren't set either in civil rights or, you know, during slave times, like, like hidden figures, even though, you know, that's a movie about black history, you know, black uh, mathematicians, when, you know, black women mathematicians, I mean, black women literally got us to the moon. 
the average person doesn't know that. Even though there was this popular, I mean, this movie did very well. I mean, because, you know, the myth in Hollywood is that, um, you know, women can't carry a movie, that Black people can't carry women. Certainly Black women can't carry a movie. And that movie made a lot of money. Like Black Panther is like the fifth highest grossing Marvel movie, I think. When I, because I, because me and my boyfriend were talking about the other day, I looked it up, but I think it's, you know, I mean, it crossed a billion. I mean, because I every time, every week I was like, go, go, go. And maybe it crossed that billion. I was like, yes. I'm like, but, but has it changed the fact that we still hear, oh, you know, black people can't carry a movie. No one cares about this. And, you know, to, to, for a black person to, I can't, I'm trying to think of a movie where it was just a black person and the fact that they were black wasn't relevant to the story. I mean, Hitch. <laughs> like and you know, and I'm the, that's not really a movie to be proud of. I mean, oh, 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 I love Hitch. Let's. I'm just saying. I don't want to hang like you know the the the. the <laughs> I don't want people to look to you know. It it was funny. It was cute, but like, it was a not great movie with Kevin James, who I love. Kevin James. But that movie was not you know a cinematic masterpiece okay uh, excuse okay, me it plumbed the depths of the human experience no um it was not <laughs> and i accept that but you're right i mean so generally we talk about how important representation is and how important it is to be able to look into a space and see potential for yourself in that space and until very recently um there was a lot of tokenism um and there still is but we're starting to move away from it and then there was a lot of uh, just one experience, right? If it's not a movie for Black people, by Black people, if it's a movie for general audiences, it's about being Black. And so right. when we start to see movies that move past that, that explore different aspects, sometimes it's what it means to be Black in different ways, right? Moonlight was amazing because it was a narrative that we had not seen on that scale certainly one that has existed forever yes but not something that we were willing to really uh talk about embrace want to watch want to learn from um so yeah absolutely and we are starting we're starting to move past that in some ways right things are starting to be a little bit more um of a nod and a wink, a wink than they are just like look look at this movie look at look, they're black did you notice yeah, it's just like, um, it's just frustrating because I'm like, if, if when a movie comes up, like, or like, like the, like the TV show Scandal, like my mother, I don't watch it, but my mother uh, cheated on me. She actually became Facebook friends with one of my friends and they had a whole little, like they would watch together and they would get on Facebook. And I was like, you didn't include me? I was, I was a little hurt, but also I don't want to watch Scandal. But no, but <laughs> the fact that you have like, um, What's Olivia Spencer? I think that's that the character name, or no, that's that's an actor. I didn't watch Scandal. <laughs> Olivia something. So with uh, Carrie Washington plays a fixer, I think in DC, and the, I'm, I've never seen this show, but I'm assuming the fact that she's black is not relevant at all. She's just this power broker who gets crap done, and I'm like, and and when we have more roles like that, where it's like here is a person who just happens to be whatever, and and and. and pick an intersection like you know trans people are going through the same thing like I mean hell you can't even get a movie about a trans person made with a trans actor you know if it's a trans woman 99.9% .9 of the time they use a male actor like what's the uh, Jeffrey Tambor in that tv show um I can't think of the name of it but um Dallas Buyers Club same thing with um uh Jared Leto played, you know, and I'm like, there was a um, Brazil Brazilian movie at the Oscars two years ago. Um, it was a documentary about a trans woman, and um, but you know, but she's gorgeous, and it's like it. They, the the thing is, is like we accept trans people if they're attractive, if they pass, if they you know look like what we assume that they should look like. But when you know the person isn't attractive or they look more masculine but they're a woman or they look more feminine when they're a man like we still don't accept that like you know we will accept you know the 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 general movie watching public will accept a black character 
that especially if it's a woman, if she's a single mother and she's got a lot of kids and she's a high school dropout, you know, pick a whole bunch of things. They'll like, they'll take that all day long. But then you have a TV show like the Cosby's and people are like, oh my gosh, that's not realistic. The Cosby's were who I grew up with. Like yeah. in my parents' church, like we had bank presidents, a woman was bank president. We had judges, we had attorneys, we had professors, we had teachers, we had, you know, airline stewardesses. And I know now that's not a, as, as glamorous a job, but, you know, back in the day, being an airline stewardess was a very glamorous position. Um, and, you know, the vast majority of the people that went to the church I went to as a child were, were professionals. Like, you know, even when, you know, when you're talking to people, like, the, the average black person is middle class. And I think that that gets lost in a lot of people because, you know, you know, I was talking um, with my partner who is white about, um, I forgot what we were talking about. And he, he said something like the black community. And then he, he made a statement. I was like, slow your roll here, buddy. I'm like, this statement implies that the vast majority of black people are impoverished, undereducated. And I said, that's just not the case. I'm like, are we disproportionately poor? Yes. Are we disproportionately incarcerated? Yes. But it's not because we are, it's not a, it's not intrinsic to us. I'm like this, the, the deck is stacked against us. And what happens is, is people look at, oh, well, other immigrant groups have come here and they've done well. Why can't you people get your act together? I'm like, well, because there's a system of discrimination that is actively working against us. And so it's just, it's, it's just exceptionally frustrating to, you know, people don't even know the right things about modern Black people. So, you know, and then you take that, that, that very narrow view of what the Black experience is and then the further back you go in history and, and, and the less you know, evidence and documentation of whatever that you have. And just people are just unwilling to accept um, whatever doesn't fit their narrative. I mean, that's just what it basically boils down to is, is mm -hmm. you know, if, if, I had, if I had found a bunch of stuff on, you know, that you know, Blacks in England were slaves, people would be like, oh, they would accept it no problem because it fits the narrative. But when I'm like, mm, Here's a whole bunch of people who were not enslaved. Oh, and in fact, slavery was illegal during SCA time period. So you're wrong. Oh, no, 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 no. Like they, they just dismiss it wholesale because yeah. it doesn't fit with their worldview. And so they, they're, and if you ask these people, you know, are they, oh, of course not. Of course not. But just the microaggressions that we face as people of color in any living history space are just, immense it's just it's frustrating to so I want to I want to really quickly highlight something you said and then we have a bunch more questions so I'm going to take them um, okay but really quickly when we talk about racism I think it's really important to remember um, a lot of people uh, feel this innate defensiveness when they hear the term racism mm -hmm. um, because they feel it's an attack on the self right I'm not racist I'm warm and welcoming and I love people and I love my friends and it's not who I am and they take it in that way yeah. and it, it kind of shuts down the processing and so I always try to remind people that racism is a structure right it's a yeah. it's a hegemonic structure that is in place and you need to think about these things not in the context of an attack on yourself but rather as action right your actions can uphold this system even if you don't realize you're doing them, right? right. I mean, because it, it's something that um, a friend of mine who actually just um, defended his um, thesis, and I don't even, it's a long thing, but basically about racism and stuff. And um, he, he actually introduced me to the term anti-racist. So you are, and the way I look at it now is you are either anti-racist, which is actively daily working against um, socialization. And that's the same for Black people as well. I mean, we, we internalize racism. And, you know, women, we internalize misogyny. And, you know, queer people, we internalize, you know, anti-queer sentiment. You know, whatever, you know, intersection you happen to find yourself on, if you're not in this country a white male, you are going to internalize something about yourself. And so to the, to the point where people 
um, don't realize that, you know, and that's kind of how it works. They don't realize that they've internalized this. And it's, it's, it's the death by the death by a thousand cuts. It's the microaggressions. It's the, well, I didn't mean anything by it, or I was just joking, or why can't you lighten up? Or, you know, people think that racism, they, they, they define racist as the Klan is really what it boils yeah. down to. to, to the average white person, if they aren't in the clan, if they aren't a card carrying white supremacist, you know, Nazi type person. Well, you know, you know, well, I, I don't have anything against them. You know, even just, you know, it's, it's, it's us and them. I don't, you know, it, no, it's like, are, you know, is the average white person going around committing acts of, you know, aggression against people of color? No. However, what happens in hiring decisions, what happens in lending decisions, what happens in, you know, education. Like, you know, if you look at King High School, for example, on the South side compared to Mature High School and Wilmette, like the the gap is like, yes. is stunning. It is like stunning. Like I, that, that's, you know, I can talk about that, but <laughs> it's just, there's, it's, there's so many levels. And, you know, and the thing that I always explain to people is, Privilege is invisible. That's how it works. And when you find yourself getting defensive and getting your hackles raised up, that's when you have to push through that and say, this feels uncomfortable. So this is something I need to work on. This is, you know, is, is my defensiveness real? Because someone is saying, like, if, if, if I lobbied an untrue claim of, against you, the individual, that you did something and you did not do that thing, then defensiveness would make sense. But if you hear me say white, like even just saying white people, when you, you could say, it could be anything like white people like pencils, right? When you, when you put the qualifier of white, that will raise white people's hackles because they're just people to them. They're just people. Like, like um, I was at my um, uh, in-law's house. I and, you so that we can oh, get. Yeah. Sorry. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because I think you're going to talk more about it here. Okay. So the next question is, do you find yourself having to prove to Black friends or family that there is more to Black history than the 400 years of slavery that is taught in school? My parents have always been very um, accepting. It's, it's like the SCA is a dirty circuit, but they've always been very open and very accepting. They've actually come to a couple of events. Um, they were there when I got elevated to the Laurels. So my mama, dad, my sister, I don't remember if my nephew, I guess he would have had to have been there. Um, but they all came um, when I got um, elevated. And then actually the crown invited, um, and I didn't realize this, that I was going to get invited to sit at head table. So I had told all these people to stay for feast, and then I couldn't even sit with them. But um, my mom actually sat with me at head table and she got to sit next to the king. So she was all, you know, she thought that was the best thing ever. So um, my family, you know, and, and just because of the lifestyle, oh, it sounds be no, not lifestyle. I just, I don't socialize with that many black people. I just, I don't know how else to say it. So I, I, I didn't have to overcome any real resistance to what I did other than the resistance that all people who don't do this and they think we're weird because like I would tell tell my friends hey I, I'm in this great when I was first in the essay I'm in this cool club and we do this stuff and you should come and they would all look at me like mm-hmm yeah that's great and it it was it was I got the same pushback you know um from white people as well as as not white people so um, I think just my, my parents have always um, just, especially my mom, advocated for new experiences and not saying no to things. So unlike, I know a lot of other, uh, specifically other Black people, just because in general, Black people, again, are very conservative. And I don't mean like liberal versus conservative. I mean, tradition, and this is what we do, and this is what we do. So um, anything outside of that norm can be really hard for um, a lot of Black people. But fortunately, I did not have uh, that experience. I have definitely heard the uh, uh, the joke of, oh, that white people thing you do. <laughs> um, and it has, it has definitely taken some level of me having to explain it over and over and over again. I'm like, so I don't know if you think people of color were like a new invention, but this is not that white people thing I do. There are, there are people of color 
here and there are people of color in history and those histories should be explored. Um, and certainly I understand the idea that the SCA is um, largely white. And that's, that's just a factual statement. Um, but I do think that it is worth putting in the effort to carve out the space. Um, I'm gonna jump around because we, we have a lot of questions. I wanna make sure we're getting to all of them. Oh, sure. So um, the next thing I wanna ask is any thoughts on how the average, largely white, a CA group could effectively promote the existence and contributions of black individuals in medieval Europe at demos without falling into tokenism? Hmm. See, that's the, I think if you just, whatever, whatever you're doing, if you just integrate people of color into that without, like, if you hold up a, a, a portrait of St. Maurice, for example, so St. Maurice was a um, 13th century German saint. He's a, clearly a black person, like, it's not in dispute, like, you know, um, and so you can just you can show him in his armor and you can show him next to other people and you don't have to inherently point out, and here is the black one. It's like, you know, and here's, and, and I'm a black person. So I study black stuff. I, I don't unfortunately know about other people of color. You know, I don't know about Asian. I don't know about Indian or this also Asian. Um, I, don't, I don't know about the other people of color. Um, so I can't speak to that, but um, just, you just talk about the black historical figures like you would talk about any other historical figure. And if you have a depiction of it, it'll be fairly obvious that this is a black person. Um, and- Intentionality also makes a difference. Um, seeking out varied personas to represent at demos, seeking out um, if you're doing a &S stuff, look at those people who are exploring cultures that are not what we typically consider Eurocentric. So look for those. Um, I tell people all the time, artifacts are a great way mm -hmm. to be able to showcase a culture without needing to necessarily wear it as a persona. So if this is something you're interested in, um, there are all kinds of examples of that online. Caravans of Gold is a museum exhibit that happened at Northwestern University here and it's now online. There's an app for it. Oh, um, okay. It's super cool. And it's got all kinds of stuff from medieval Africa. I actually and went there. Um, that I will send you the link. I'll put it in chat too. Yeah, I, bu I bought the book. So, cause I, um, I have um, a variety of uh, Facebook groups as you well know. And so I think it was for my reenactors of color Facebook group, I'm not sure. But I, I went there and I went live and um, as much as I could without getting in trouble. But and I bought the book and and I had some of um, the folks who were in that group to come meet me there. And I took a lot of pictures and I posted them <laughs> on, online um, just because, um, again, it's like pe when people if you if you asked if you just stopped a random person on the street of any color and asked them to describe Africa, they're going to talk about famine. They're going to talk about um, um, lack of natural resources. They're going to talk about war. It is not going to be a pretty picture. And I'm like, OK, so that may be true in, in certain modern countries now, but that also that's true in other places as well. And it's just we never see things, or we rarely, I should say, see things like caravans of gold. And I was happy to see that that uh, that exhibit was very well attended. Yes, um, you know, and and it's people, popular. yeah, I mean, and just and this and just the stuff, just the material culture, because the, you know, again, depending on what you're, you know, what you're looking at in terms of time frame, there's just not a whole lot of stuff available. So to see like literal gold, I mean, you know, e Ethiopia was a, a is Ethiopia, was a huge um, source of, I don't know, that's your your uh, area of expertise, but it's just a huge <laughs> source of gold. And, and there's like, you know, there's stuff back into the 14th century and where, you know, it's these, these um, gifts of gold and other precious and semi-precious things that were given by um, royals. Like African royals were received as royals. Like they were, they yes. were re received as, you know, dignitaries, head of state, because there was one um, I don't have it memorized, but there was uh, there was a dude who was oh there was a Spanish dude who was offended that the African I don't know what country it was and I and I hate to just say Africa as a monolith but it was there was an African head of state whose entourage he had been given more servants than him he was very upset and put out by this 
And I'm like, mm, eh, sorry. <laughs> so um, it's just like, like you say, I mean, and this is, you know, that's your, your, your area of expertise. Um, but just being very clear that this is not other because that's because that's what happens like in you know in history now it's like there's American history and then there's black American history and I'm like it should just be one history now the reason why obviously we have black history month you know which started from black history week was because you know Carter G Woodson understood that we if he if we didn't promote it that it would not have been included in and it still is appalling to me when I when I talk to many of my white friends that they literally were taught well there was slavery and then Abraham Lincoln saved the day and then you know Jim Crow was bad but everybody in the north was happy and <laughs> Martin Luther King marched and now everyone's happy so they don't they literally don't understand why black people are still angry like so do you notice much of a difference in attitude from immigrants or first generation Americans? In terms of? I'm assuming in terms of general um, knowledge of black history and black folks place in history. No, I mean, uh, unfortunately my experience is that, um, you know, recent immigrants um, embrace racism. It seems to be like, it's it's like a rite of passage of becoming an American, right? Becoming a U.S. person is you just embrace racism. I mean, I have been told, and other people I know have been told to go back to Africa by people who are, you know, newly immigrated to this country themselves. I'm like, I'm not African. I'm American. Or you, I, I'm trying to not use that term anymore. I'm, I, I am a U.S. person. I was born here. My parents were born here. My grandparents were born here. My great-grandparents were born here. Like, and my one going back to my mother's side, we've traced back nine generations. Like, I'm American. That's what I am. I am. It, it, I, I clearly I am of African descent because I am brown and I have kinky coily hair. But I'm like, like you know, anyone from Europe is cl way closer to Africa in proximity than I am just because of the, you know how the continent works. So, unfortunately. And it seems very like specific with um, Eastern Europeans have, that's who I've had the most difficulty with are ex, in my, you know, and this I'm using, painting this with a broad stroke, but in my experience as my individual experience, the immigrants that I have experienced the most racism from are Eastern Europeans who are, are very adamant about go back to Africa and, and you don't belong here. And I'm like, what? Sorry, I almost cursed. What are you talking about? So, um, um, so no, no, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you, I did warn you. I, I did warn her like before we before this. I'm like I talk a lot, so just yeah, interrupt me like you've been doing. Girl, right? you're fine. I just I, so I'm gonna go ahead to the next one, and then we have a little bit of time, and I actually have a question for you. Um, sure. so. Because the SCA is still, sadly, grounded in the Victorian colonialist interpretation of the Middle Ages, how much do you think that affects general pop and SCA general pop understanding of Africans in the Middle Ages? Well, basically, like I said, um, my experience and the experience of other um, Black people in the SCA is that we are still actively today being told that we weren't there. Um, it, it, you know, I mean, even the Eastern European folks, like the Slavic folks, I remember like that was a big push. Um, I don't, I'm not good with time frame, but it, I know it's been within the last 10 years to not just focus on even Western Europe, but then you have people that are doing the Middle East that are doing Asia. You know, we have Sir Ish that does Aztec. Um, I've had a few people ask me about, um, uh, First Nations people from this continent. And I just, I don't, you know, have a lot of um, experience with that. But because if, if you're relying on what we know and what we learn in world history, every world history class that I've ever taken has been Western Europe, point blank. And so that's just how 
that that is that is the the you know and most people go to to um public school but even in private school it's like you know um we studied uh, so i was in public school and and um in a program called international baccalaureate and so we we had to study a history that was um on our continent but not our country so we could choose you know so that there are three countries here so it was either uh, Mexico or Canada. So um, we studied Canadian literature, but Mexican history. Um, but even that experience is just that this US people are just, we learn a very white centric, white people are great um, US um, history. And we fought those terrible British people because we were the best. And, you know, the world didn't, you know, was in the in the darkness until our country was founded and that is just that it's just a, a pervasive mindset and if and there's really no incentive to do anything else other than if a person decides to you know when they, if they decide to go to college and and study other histories or if they just decide to do it but even still everything is very western european centric and so getting even to Eastern Europe is a stretch. And then, you know, maybe you, you touch a wee bit on Asia, but, it, you know, again, it's only in reference anytime that, that outside of Europe is studied, it's usually through the lens of colonial, colonialism. So, you know, I mean, India has been around for a very long time, but people don't, the only thing that people know about India is Gandhi, right? And, or the East India, you know, trading company. It, it's always, it's just white interaction, which usually is domination, colonialization, you know, th that is for most people, white, black, whatever in the United States, their, whatever history that they know starts with white domination. It's just the way it is, unfortunately, unless you take it upon yourself to, um, to do something different and to, and to look and study. So I'm gonna put out a quick call. Um, if there are any more questions, drop them in chat. Um, there's a comment in chat about, um, for many East Europeans, the feeling against darker skinned people is linked to the dislike and stigma of the Romani. So that kind of brings me to something that we've been talking about pretty, pretty circularly all night, which is um, constructions of whiteness and what it means to be white. Um, now, I think that something that a lot of people maybe don't internalize until, until they are looking more into things like critical race theory um, or the like, is that what it means to be white has changed drastically and radically, um, even in the last hundred years, yes. let alone the last thousand years. Um, and what we, and you talked about this a little bit, that what we consider racism to look like today is very much not something that has always been in place. Like, um, Italians weren't considered white until the 50s. Greeks Irish weren't considered were white. white. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, people from Eastern Europe weren't considered white. And, and really like the, the shift, if you look very specifically was post-war in this country when, when, you know, you have all the GIs coming back and, and basically you're kicking all the, all the women and all the people of color who filled in roles during the war. So clearly we're capable, but now these people come back and they need jobs and there's only so many jobs. So we get kicked out again. And you start looking at, um, it's where the suburbs start to really rise and um, the GI bill and all the, you know, and, and where people can live. And that is when, like I said, it, because there's, um, there's a couple books. There's one, I, I think the title is When Did Italians Become Right? And the other is When Did the Irish Become Right? White. But they very specifically talk about how, like when we, like now, if you, Italians are white, right? Like people just accept that. It's not a, it's not a question. Irish are white. Of course they're white. Like white, you know, they're, and, but, but it wasn't a necessarily about skin color because, you know, in general, Irish people are very pale, right? So it wasn't in terms of is their skin white, but were they white enough? Were they, um, you know, because a lot of the Irish were Catholic. So, oh, sorry, that's my alarm. I'm take my medication. <laughs> um, you know, and again, that's, that's, you know, that there's people who are much smarter than me who've written a lot of books about that. But 
it really like, and, and what, what you see happening is back to the immigration issue, the, the, and again, this is just my opinion. When you look at, at groups of people who are actively more, um, I guess, physically racist than other groups, like the, the police forces, a, a lot of which have roots in um, capturing or recapturing people who escaped from slavery, right? I mean, it's just that I, this is the truth. I didn't, you know, you can, you can look it up. Um, a lot of those police forces were Irish, like certainly here in Chicago, um, or Italian, or, you know, some mixture, you know, therein. And so what seems to happen is, you know, the, the, the people who just got invited to the white table, if you will, in order to prove their whiteness, they are extra. Like, you know, and again, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to not paint this broad brushes. I'm not saying that every East, Eastern European is racist. I'm not saying that every Italian is racist. I'm not saying that every Irish person is racist. I'm saying in my experience, those three groups of people, if they tend to be racist, they are hardcore committed to the cause of racism to, to say, as, so as if to say, thank you for letting me sit at the white table and now I will, you know, crap rolls downhill. So, um, and then, you know, and unfortunately, you know, after 9-11 for a while, it was um, people from the Middle East sort of were, you know, at the bottom, but really black people are, you know, in, in, in the oppression Olympics, we're going to take the gold. It's just, it's just I mean, so anti-blackness is uh, <clears throat> prevalent, right? And anti-blackness uh, extends across many different cultures in yes. different ways, right? So even within Black culture itself, you have colorism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I mean, we, we could talk all night about the problems with anti-Blackness and how it, how it works out. But usually it's people who are invested in not being at the bottom of a social structure yes. will absolutely uphold that social structure because they don't want one where they might be at the bottom of it. Or people well, who were recently close to the bottom of it yeah. and have moved out of it are like, well, well, and then even if you look, you know, you know, another intersection within the black community in terms of, you know, like colorism, but also gender. And so like black women and then queer black women are at the absolute bottom. Like there is, you know, I, again, it is not a contest. However, <laughs> at least in these United States, a, a black woman of a, a black woman a, a queer black woman is just at the bottom. Like at the, the, the poop has rolled all the way downhill to cover her and there's, you're just at the bottom. And so, um, you know, like if you look at, you know, I'm not trying to get overly political, but um, our current president did better among black male voters than previous Republican candidates have done. And I'm like, you know, well, why is that? And it's like, well, if you look at what he was saying and and what his followers were saying, it's like you know again, it's like we're gonna we're gonna poop on black women, and so um, you know, Black Lives Matter was started by black women. The civil rights movement, of which a lot the vast majority of people in this country do not understand, was started by black women, and then the black men were like, okay, ladies. Now that this thing is up and running, we're gonna, you know, we're, we're gonna come. Like even the decision to, you know, I think a lot of people don't know that um, Rosa Parks sitting, you know, um, refusing to move on the bus, it was planned. It wasn't, um, it wasn't spontaneous. You know, it looked that way, but you know, it was very much planned because there had been a young lady who um, I wanna say maybe two months earlier had done the same thing, but she was unmarried she had a child, she was younger and she was darker skinned. And so she was determined to be, you know, we were playing respectability politics, you know, which is a whole nother ball. Yeah. Of us. But so it, it's just. Um, no, you it, very much see it. Marsha P. Johnson with Stonewall. You, I mean, you see it, you see it over and over and over. <laughs> I do want to, I want to wrap things up. We have one last question. Okay. I'm going to read. Um, and then I wanna, I wanna give you a chance to kind of wrap things up and call it a night. So the last question I'm gonna take is, uh, 
do you find that you hesitate to seek out other people of color that you don't know at events? I realized a few years ago that I would do just that because I was subconsciously worried about inner race judgment. It's the same problem we have in admitting to friends and family of color that we are part of the SCA. No, I, if I saw another person of color, I'd be like, hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I would do the opposite. I'd be like, hey, brown person, look, there is another brown person. And, and I'm not just a brown person. I am, in, and I'm doing air, well, you can see me. I'm, doing, I'm like so used to talking over the, like I'm an important brown person. And, and, the, and something that I noticed um, is that uh, people of color are disproportionately peers compared to our population. So I don't know what the census is, but it, what, we were like, what, 1%? And that's all- Black folks are 1%. Okay, so, so Black folks are 1%, right? But of all the Black people that I know in the SCA, I, like half of us are peers? And some of us are double peers? And so, um, and I don't know- I mean, other than, you know, we're just excellent people, you know, but it, it, it just seems like in a, in a situation where you have um, so few people and I, do we stand out for the obvious reason? Like many people know who I am and I have no clue who they are. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not patting myself on the back because I'm so great. I'm like, I just stand out. I'm the black Elizabethan Laurel in the middle kingdom, right? Um, you know, in fact, like, how many times did I get um, confused for Mistress Isabella of York? Which if you have met Mistress Isabella of York, she is a literal force of nature. Like it is the, but the also the only way you could confuse us is you just know that there's a black woman who does Elizabethan. Like she does very elaborate stuff. She is considerably taller than me. She's a little bit darker skin than me. Her hair is longer than me. Like, if we are standing next to each other and we are obviously you would not can there's no reason to confuse now there are some other people that i do look more like and I, and, and you know there's there's white people that can co get confused for each other so like so i i get it from that perspective but it just seems to get amplified um with us just because there's so few i'm trying to think I, uh, i'm going in a different direction but no, no if 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 when I am at an event, if I've been at an event and I see a person of color, I'm, hey, how you doing? It doesn't even have to be a black person. Um, I'm like, hey, okay. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm always, the, the only thing I try to hesitate um, is I don't, cause sometimes I'm like, if you're just going off what a person looks like, it could be wrong. Um, like my child is biracial. Um, you know, I'm black, his father is white, but he looks Hispanic, like, you know, to, to me, like, like he, when I've seen him standing next to other Hispanic people, he blends right in, right? And so um, I'm sure that I've gone up to somebody and, and there, there probably are, you know, there's, there's also one young lady that I met who I, she is black, but I, she's fair skinned. So I didn't know, I just, I just happened to like her. And then I found out she was black. I was like, ah, I knew I liked you for a reason. That's kind of my inside joke, but um no, I, I, I get it though. I, it's, it's sort of like, you know, if you're in a situation where there's very few women, unfortunately, a lot of times rather than collaborate, it becomes a competition uh, because, you know, there's the, it's rarefied air and there's only so many spots. So I got to make sure I hold on to my spot. And so, you know, there can um, become competition, but, you know, I have, I have found that by coming together um, and, and trying to build a community of people of color because, you know, we, when you're in a space, like when you're in a space and you're, and you're talking, um, so I'm just trying to think like, oh, Penzik, right? Penzik's a big, big event. I'm telling you, if there are three black people standing around, people will come over like, Hey, what's going on? <laughs> and it, it happened. Like it just <laughs> happens that there are three black people who happen to be friends or whatever, and they are talking to each other about whatever, about man, it's hot, it's Penzik, so man, it's hot or man, it's wet or man, it's hot, right? It's not just shooting the crap, not talking about blackness. We just happen to be black and people are like, oh, what, what, what's going on? 
going on? And to the point now where I would just, I just, it, it became a joke. It happens so often that I just made, oh, 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 oh they're here. To, let, let's stop talking about the revolution we're planning because, but, but it happens, but that happens also in my everyday life is, is if there are three or more black people standing together, just existing while black, People are like, what's going on? I remember when I was in college, the same thing happened. Like, um, so our the the dining hall um, on North part of campus, um, there was like there's there was the North part, the West part, and the South part. So for whatever reason, uh, most of the black kids tended to sit on the West part. Um, I had a multicultural group of friends, so sometimes we sat on the West part, sometimes we sat on the other two parts, and. I'm telling you, anytime, again, there'd be two, three Black people together, people people that did not even know us would just kind of casually <laughs> stroll by so they could see if something was afoot. And I'm like, really? And it's just, it's, 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 it, it's hurtful. It's frustrating. Um, but if, if I saw, if any, I mean, anywhere I see, if there's a space where there's not a whole lot of black people and I see a black person, I do not. Like, hey, a black person, I see you. I see you, I'm black, you're black, we're black. And there's there's kind of that, like in my mind, I'm kind of imagining like, you know, if something pops off, I got you, you got me right now. Nothing's gonna pop off. <laughs> That's not really how it happens. But um, I think it just, you know, like things are generational and it just comes from having to navigate spaces where you are alone and you see anyone who looks remotely like they might be an ally and it's like okay I'm gonna reach out to that person now they may or may not not be but it, you know I mean there, there were classes where I'm, I'm you know classroom of 300 people I'm literally only a black person it's like oh all right it's a thing I got used to but um it was just, and it's not, you know, anything that we did. It's just, we just, you see a black person on campus, do not, do not, do not. I, I see you, I see you. And and that's just how, that's, I mean, I, I try to be a friendly person, um, even though apparently a bunch of people are scared of me, but whatever. Um, but very specifically go out of my way when I see um, a person of color and specifically a, a black person, especially if that is a black woman. I'm like, there is, you know, if you want to do this, you can do it. Um, and and because what happens is whether or not people are meaning to, they always filter things through the fact that you're black. Like, um, like I've had my friends worry that it looked bad that I was cooking for them because I'm black. I'm like, I, I'm cooking for you because I like to cook and you didn't want to do it and I wanted to and there's no, like, I'm like, if I were white, would we be having this conversation? No. So, you know, so let's not put this extra layer on there. And and it comes from a, a place of well-meaning, but again, it just tends to tokenize and other and, um, you know, like people were excited about um, Seto being king. Now, Seto happens to be a great person, but I, you know, I, I have to, just from my experience and watching people interact with him, there was a whole lot of look. He, he, it's it's our black royal. It's our black royal, and 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 wanting to be in proximity so that they could get credit for being for for knowing the black royal. And it's like it's just it's a heavy burden to have to carry, and it, and it's frustrating. And it's you know I, I can't speak for anyone else, but it's like just treat me like you treat everybody else. And you know, the, going back to your question about how do we specifically recruit and um, depict um, people of color from, from historical, just if, if you're talking about knights, just put it in there. If you're talking about whatever, just, and the, here is this person and here is this person, but you, but you have to do it. You have to, um, you know, because especially depending on where you are, your group probably just might not have any people of color in it. And you, but you don't have to be a person of color to study the history of people of color. And I think that, that a lot of times people are like, well, you know, 
but I'm, I'm not black or I'm not whatever. And I, I'm like, do you know how to read? Do you, I mean, St. Maurice is probably, I mean, I just haven't studied cause I don't, I'm not into 13th century German, but I'm like, I'm sure St. Maurice is probably a, just an interesting person period. And so study about that person and, and learn about them. And, and, you know, it, it, we have to normalize it. Like, you know, like, um, like I legit didn't know, like as a child, I didn't know that white people watch TV shows with black people on it. I just, it wasn't, a, I just didn't know. And then, you know, and then, you know, talking to my um, partner and and he talked about watching a different world and he's like, you know, he's the whitest white dude that ever lived. And I'm like, what, you watched a different world? What, huh? And I'm like, oh, it was a very popular show. And there's only, you know, black people only make up, you know, depending on when, 10 to 13% of the population. So a show has to be liked by the majority if it's going to be, you know, Cosby show was on for what, 12 years or something like that? I have no idea. Oh, however many. Like, and, and I'm still mad at Bill Cosby, but that's a whole nother subject. But um, we, we have to stop like black history is history it's the hist it, it's for everyone you don't have to be a black person to care about black history it's like if you were a person that cares about history you should want to know about all of it um and so seek it out and then you know if, if you've got a question like you know i i've kind of designated myself as the safe negro i call it to my friends <laughs> like if, if you want to ask a question and you're not quite sure uh, uh, go ahead. But I'm like, before you ask me this question now, have you Googled it? Did you Google it? Google it and, you know, read some articles and get some different perspectives because I am one person. I cannot give you the go ahead. Well, you know, Harley said X, Y, Z, so it's okay. No, 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 no. I don't play that. You have to make the first step. If you're a person that is interested in whatever it is you're interested in and you're only and you're only finding because you know depending on what it is you're, you're going to run into the same sources over and over again i'm like okay so we've all seen these same portraits what else is there out there are you are you looking at you know you know the countries of asia the countries of africa are you looking at you know whatever we you know is known about you know north america during that time period like are you seeking it out you don't have to wait for the information to be presented by a person of color. Um, because, you know, maybe, like I said, if you're in an area where there's just not any people of color in your group, but you have done a very thoughtful um, survey of whatever the information that you're presenting is, and someone sees that, um, because, um, you know, people have asked, well, why is it so hard to get people of color interested in the SEA? Um, and it's like, well, if you're at a demo, and all you see is a bunch of white people doing something that seems very foreign to you. I mean, you know, it's it's like anything else. Like, you know, there are you know intrepid people among you know all cultures, but people are tend to you know kind of stick to what they know. And so, um, uh, I don't know point I was trying to make. It's just it's it's incumbent on all of us to study like like we don't you know we we know like the, the the general world history which is basically western europe we know about that we know about that so what are we doing to expand beyond that are we looking at not just north africa because we know about colorism there where people don't like people don't understand that egypt is in africa morocco is in africa tunisia is in africa mm -hmm. It's called the Middle East, but that's Africa. Those are in the African continent. And we talk about Sub-Saharan African is really just, you know, code for where the brown people are, the darker brown people. Um, and and are, you, are you looking at India pre, um, you know, uh, Great Britain? Are you looking at, I mean, like, like China's, I mean, thousands of years old. Like, are we looking at China? Are we looking at Japan? Are we looking at, you know, yeah, are we being intentional about <laughs> how we're studying, who we're researching, what we're looking into? I yeah, just like, you know, I know that, um, I don't know if it's gone through yet, but that the the SCA was looking at changing um, like pre-17th pre, um, century 
Europe to just pre 17th century period. And, and oh, that happened two years ago. <laughs> oh, okay, so I'm clearly not up on anything, but the introduction is the part of corpora that's going to be updated. Um, but the mission statement removed Europe in 2017. So I guess it's three years ago at this point. Okay. But people are still like, I've seen discussions online where people are still like actively upset about it. And they like, like, well, we, we, we study Europe and I'm like, we ever, I mean, I've been in, you know, I, I, like I said, joined in 99 and I'm like, there were always people doing other areas that were not Western Europe. It was just, but it was, it was much harder for them to get recognized in those. And then you, then you have the whole, you know, cultural appropriation wasn't seen as an issue then and it's seen now and but all the people that i that i've seen doing um um especially african personas because like I, I didn't even know that there was a whole you know group dedicated to that that people seem to really want to um uh, be respectful and you know it, it's always just going to be hard because when you have people who are alive from a culture that is still actively being persecuted for existing, then be treated like a costume by white people. You know, on the one hand, do I want people to study it? Yes, but on the other hand, like, but you, like we've talked about, you can study a thing, you can have material, you know, you can have artifacts without, like I can have this, you know, I can have this thing and I can talk about it and, and, and but I don't have to, incorporate it into what I'm doing. So it's just, as you well know, when the, the topic of cultural appropriation- We're not gonna get into that. No, 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 it's, it's very sticky, but I'm just saying it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah, they're, they're, we're always gonna be walking the line, I think of being between purposeful and tokenism and it's it's a complicated thing, but just because it's complicated doesn't mean it's something that we should that we should avoid. Because if you want people of color to feel welcome, it's not just saying, "Hey, we don't care what color you are as long as you study Western Europe." That's not particularly welcoming, because what it's what it's saying is, "Well, as long as and, and then and then what the subtext is, well, you can come and pretend to be white too." Because that's that's the unspoken part of it. It's like we, we have to acknowledge that non-white people were in Europe, have been in Europe for a long time, for centuries. And, and the contributions of, you know, other parts of the world, like, I mean, Arabic numerals, like right. the numbers that we use, algebra, zero, like, I mean, why are we not talking about this? You know, we talk about Copernicus and Galileo, and, but why, and I, I just, I don't know um, I only know the stuff I care about, so I don't know the, the particular mathematicians and historic, but I'm like, why are we not talking about that? Why is that not important? Why are we not talking about, you know, the, 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 the kings and the sultans and the emperors of various and sundry countries who had, you know, very elaborate, you know, costume, if it's in terms of, you know, um, yes, a lot of the European stuff is super fancy, but I'm like, for the same time period, like, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the stuff from Asia, I mean, very ornate, you know, you know, pick a place and just very ornate and very detailed and so many layers and, and very interesting. And, and like, um, you know, I did a, um, uh, Indian inspired feast for, um, 12th night a couple of years ago. And, and for the most part, it was very well received. Um, but I did hear some grumblings about, you know, cause it wasn't the same, boring, you know, you know, we're here in the Midwest and basically people want meat and potatoes. And so to do something or like the feast that you did, which was fantastic, y'all, it was so tasty, but it, it was, it was a, a flavor profile that people are like, it's like, they seem like they're afraid of it. I'm like, you, you gotta be open to embracing things and maybe you don't like it, but to just say, well, I'm not even going to try that because I don't want any of that food and then pick the wrong, like I heard people complaining about my feast, calling it Middle Eastern food. I'm like, it's not Middle East, what? Maybe like, but, but you can't even be bothered if you're going to be, you know, bigoted, at least could you get the dang on country, right? But it, that's where I just get frustrated where people are just, they just close themselves off. Well, 
I, if it's not Western Europe, then I'm not interested. And I'm like, that's not going to be welcoming for a whole swath of people, but very specifically for people who um, want to, you know, explore where they're from. You know, just the fact that people don't even know that, you know, Africa is a continent comprised of 83 countries. And like, when you say Africa, when, where? Right. And, you know, there's a lot to unpack. And I think, I think the intentionality with which we engage in the SCA is going to have to be more focused on the bringing in other cultures and exploring other things because you know this was a piece about we were there well we are here and our voices should be represented and our status in the SCA should be accepted and expected and prepared for just like any other and it shouldn't be reactive it should be proactive um we are pretty much out of time. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I told you I probably was going to talk the whole time. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and doing this talk. Um, you'll probably look at the comments after this, but uh, people are very, very, very appreciative. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming and listening tonight. Um, this is a really great discussion about a topic that's very close to me. Um, and I'm just so grateful to Harley for being here to go through it. And I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us for this talk. Um, so this week in DEI is every single Wednesday. It's at 7 p.m. Central. Facebook sometimes messes with me. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing chivalric discussions, DEI and the Shiv. And we will have a panel of six knights who will come and talk about their experiences in the realm of DEI. Uh, it should be really, really exciting. I'll get that event up soon. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank to you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and holiday if you're celebrating.